Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number 9 of the Delhi edition. In this column, the writers evaluate India's relations with Central Asia and they talk about the geopolitical, geostrategic and geoeconomic significance of the Central Asia region. They examine India's interests in Central Asia and the challenges that lie ahead for India considering the current situation in Afghanistan following the takeover by Taliban along with the destabilizing role of Pakistan and China in the region. As these developments affect Indian interests in Central Asia, India is looking to recalibrate its ties with Central Asia and that is the focus of this column. But first, let's understand the background to India's relations with Central Asia. See, this is where the Central Asia region is located. It is located to the north of South Asia and is sandwiched between the Eurasia and the West Asia region. The Central Asia region includes five countries which were part of the former Soviet Union including Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. These are the five Central Asian republics and the region is a landlocked region meaning the region doesn't have direct access to the sea. Yes, in the map, you can see the Caspian Sea over here, but the Caspian Sea is not an open sea and is essentially a lake and even known as the world's largest inland body of water. So essentially, the Central Asia region is bound on all the sides without direct access to an open sea. And this happens to be a key geographical limitation in geopolitics because it acts as a restriction on trade and commerce. Now, this is a huge impediment for the Central Asia region, especially for India's relations with Central Asia, because the region is blessed with immense natural resources. All the five Central Asian countries are blessed with natural resources, and it is said that they possess almost all the minerals on the Mendeleev's table or the periodic table. These countries have reserves of uranium, precious metals like gold. They even have reserves of rare earth metals, cobalt, tin, zinc, etc. Along with hydrocarbon reserves, particularly massive reserves of natural gas. And some of these countries also have tremendous hydropower potential. So like this, the Central Asian countries are blessed with natural resources. But despite India and Central Asia having very close and historical relations, we are not able to tap into these resources due to the lack of direct connectivity with the region. See, as per this map, India was supposed to share boundaries with Afghanistan at this narrow stretch of land corridor known as the Wakhan Corridor. But on the ground in Jammu and Kashmir, India doesn't have control of this area as it has been illegally occupied by Pakistan. So since Pakistan captured this part of J&K, which we know as Pakistan-occupied Kashmir since 1947, India lost direct access to Afghanistan, which would have helped India to have direct land connectivity with Central Asia. But now for India, the only land route through which it can connect with Central Asia is via Pakistan. And Pakistan would never grant India the transit access needed to connect with Afghanistan and the Central Asian region. So this has become a huge impediment for India's connectivity with Central Asia and we are not able to realize the full potential of this relationship. Because see, India and Central Asia region share historical civilizational links. Since the ancient times, the two regions were trading with each other through the Silk Route and there has also been very close cultural interactions through the exchange of religious philosophies such as Buddhism and Islam. Even Babur, the founder of Mughal Empire in India, came from the Fargana Valley, which is located in today's Central Asia. So there is a strong historical, civilizational and cultural link that exists between India and Central Asia. And this continued into the modern world as well. Post-1947, India and the Soviet Union developed very close relations, especially during the Cold War. And as India aligned more with the Soviet Union post-1971, India automatically got closer to the Central Asia region as well 
because during the Cold War, these Central Asian countries were part of the Soviet Union itself. These five Central Asian countries that we have today, they were former Soviet republics. And many of the defense equipment that India was purchasing from Soviet Union were being manufactured in factories located in today's Central Asia. In fact, during the Soviet era, India enjoyed tremendous soft power influence in Central Asia, not just because of the historical cultural links, but also because of modern cultural links as Indian art, movies, music, and dance forms are very popular in Central Asian countries. But in 1991, when the Soviet Union disintegrated and the Cold War came to an end, these former Soviet republics became independent nations and India had to reset its relations with Central Asia. So to continue the close relations with the region, India entered into a strategic partnership agreement with major countries like Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. And from the 1990s, India started providing financial aid to these countries to assist them in their development projects. And India started focusing more on the trade and defense relations with these newly formed Central Asian countries. So essentially, the top priorities for India in Central Asia includes connectivity with the region, because since India doesn't have direct access, it has to come out with alternative mechanisms in order to create and build innovative connectivity routes so that India can leverage its strong relations with these countries to gain access to their resources. India is very interested in accessing key resources of Central Asia, such as uranium, rare earth metals, hydrocarbon reserves and natural gas, and even hydropower. In fact, India has even signed civil nuclear agreements with few countries, such as Kazakhstan, to source uranium from these countries to power India's civilian nuclear program. Then since the region holds a lot of strategic and geoeconomic significance, there are several regional and global powers that are engaged in an intense competition. We have the traditional power that is Russia. Then we have other major powers such as China, the United States, European Union, and even smaller countries like Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, which are all competing for influence in Central Asia. So the policies of some of these countries adversely affects Indian interests and countering them is also India's top priority. For example, China's Belt and Road Initiative is heavily focused on the Central Asia region and China has already executed several connectivity projects and pipelines that connect China with Central Asia. This not only brings India and China into a direct competition, but India is also deeply concerned about one of the components of BRI, which is the CPEC project or the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Because the CPEC project has been designed to pass through Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, which directly challenges India's sovereignty and India's territorial claims over this region, which has been illegally occupied by Pakistan. Then, of course, India is concerned about Pakistan's role in the region because its sponsorship of various terrorist outfits along the Afghanistan-Pakistan belt has led to rise in radicalism, extremism and fundamentalism in the Central Asian region as well. Many of the radical and extremist groups found in Central Asia have very close links with other terror organizations in the Afghanistan-Pakistan belt, which have been nurtured by the Pakistani state agencies. Then upon this, the constant destabilization of Afghanistan and more importantly, the recent takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban has caused deep concern for India because it completely derails India's outreach towards Central Asia. India was heavily dependent on Afghanistan to gain transit access to Central Asian countries. But now with Afghanistan coming under the control of the Taliban, it threatens the several connectivity projects that India had invested in in the region. Without these connectivity projects and without Afghanistan, India cannot reach out to Central Asia and it completely compromises Indian interests in the Central Asia region. So maintaining connectivity with the region is our top priority, not just to access the Central Asian resources, but also to counter other powers such as China and Pakistan and to tackle terrorism and the threats posed by groups like the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda. In this regard, India launched the Connect Central Asia policy in 2012 
which is India's dedicated foreign policy outreach towards the region. Under this policy, India has tried to strengthen political, economic, strategic and historical and cultural links with Central Asia region and India has emerged as one of the key investors and even provides financial aid and support to these countries in the form of line of credit. India has announced close to $1 billion worth of line of credit for these countries to be invested in development projects and has even extended the benefits of several schemes such as the ITEC program of the Ministry of External Affairs through which India provides educational and training scholarships to friendly developing nations which are located in its area of interest. The ITEC program or the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation is also a major soft power initiative of the foreign ministry to help in the development efforts of smaller countries and also to gain soft power and cultural influence in the focus countries. As Indian interest in the region has been facing several challenges, India has further accelerated its focus on the region. In 2015, Prime Minister Modi paid a historic visit to all the five Central Asian countries in order to further strengthen India's Connect Central Asia policy. Under this initiative, we have taken up several important connectivity projects, including the Chabahar port project in Iran, through which India can connect with Afghanistan, which is also a landlocked nation. And in 2017, we even signed a trilateral agreement with Iran and Afghanistan so that a direct trade and economic route can be established between India, Iran and Afghanistan. India had ambitious plans to further extend this connectivity project into Central Asia so that it could bypass the hurdles created by Pakistan. But now, the fate of this project hangs in the balance due to the current situation in Afghanistan and also due to deteriorating relations with Iran. Another connectivity project which could have helped India connect with Central Asia is the INSTC project or the International North-South Transport Corridor. This project is supposed to connect India with Iran and Azerbaijan located over here next to the Caspian Sea and with Russia. It is supposed to create a shorter alternative route to connect with Russia and other parts of Europe bypassing the longer traditional route that passes through the Atlantic. This project could have always been extended into Afghanistan and Central Asia and even from Caspian Sea, we could have reached out to Central Asian countries. But again, the current state of relations between India and Iran and the dynamic situation in the region has created a lot of uncertainties for the INSTC project, which could further hamper India's connectivity plans with the Central Asia and Eurasia region. Then India is also very much focused on the Ashgabat Agreement which is focused on Central Asian connectivity. And in 2018, India has been formally included as a member to the Ashgabat Agreement. This agreement basically provides for a multimodal transport agreement between Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan with Iran and Oman in West Asia. These Central Asian and West Asian countries had set up the Ashgabat Agreement to create a multimodal transport connectivity route and recently they have even included Pakistan and India as members to the Ashgabat Agreement. So this is yet another connectivity project that India is interested in to gain access to Central Asia. Then we have the ongoing Tapi pipeline project which involves Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan and India and it is essentially a natural gas pipeline through which we are planning to transport natural gas from Turkmenistan extracted at the Galinish natural gas field via a pipeline built through Afghanistan and Pakistan which finally reaches India after passing through important locations such as Herat and Kandahar in Afghanistan and Quetta and Multan in Pakistan and finally lands at Fazilka which is a border town in India. This project was even backed by the United States as it was supposed to bring benefits to Afghanistan as well. But this ongoing project has hit a major roadblock due to the current situation in Afghanistan. As the Taliban has taken over and as the Tapi pipeline passes through Taliban strongholds, the future of this project is uncertain, thereby affecting India's connectivity with Central Asia. Then to further engage with the Central Asia region, 
India has been very interested in important regional organizations such as the SCO or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Because this grouping includes major Central Asian countries such as Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and brings together other major powers such as Russia, China, Pakistan and India. Recently, it has been decided to even admit Iran as a member and India is engaging very closely with the SCO in order to promote economic engagement and strategic relations with the region. Because the SCO is focused on connectivity projects in the region, it is focused on trade and economic relations and it also focuses on strategic issues such as counter-terrorism and experts had always felt that SCO was the best platform to handle the situation in Afghanistan and to stabilize the country. Because this grouping included all the key members located in and around Afghanistan. But unfortunately, due to the divides within the group, the SEO has been very ineffective to collectively act against the current situation in Afghanistan. Then India has extended its focus from Central Asia to Eurasia as well and is focusing on Eurasian countries such as Armenia as well. Hence, India engages closely with the Eurasian Economic Union, which is led by Russia and brings together few Central Asian and Eurasian countries. It is essentially a trade union and a customs union involving Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia and Belarus. India is working very closely with this customs union and we are even negotiating a free trade agreement. So through such focus on regional groupings, we are trying to step up our economic and strategic engagement with Central Asia. But all these connectivity projects and diplomatic initiatives are being threatened by the current destabilization in Afghanistan and by the controversial role of Pakistan and China in the region. Pakistan's sponsorship of terrorism, its links with Taliban, Islamic State, Al-Qaeda and the other terror groups threatens Indian security interests and this is a common concern that we share with Central Asian countries. Then China's dominant role in the region, its ambitious Belt and Road Initiative and the alignment of the CPEC project is something that is of concern to India and these developments are posing new challenges for Indian interests in the Central Asia region. It is in this regard that India is looking to recalibrate its ties with Central Asian countries and this is what explains the special focus being given by India in the recent months as a result of which India's External Affairs Minister has visited the region three times in just four months. This is quite unprecedented because in just the last four months, India's Foreign Minister, Dr. Jai Shankar, has visited three important countries in the region. He paid a visit to Kyrgyzstan and announced a line of credit of around $200 million to support development projects in the country. India and Kyrgyzstan have even signed an agreement on high-impact community development projects in order to give financial support to the socio-economic projects of Kyrgyzstan. Then the foreign minister even travelled to Kazakhstan and participated at the foreign minister's meeting of SICA, which stands for Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia. This platform brings together important Central Asian countries and other regional powers together and gives a platform for the foreign ministers to discuss issues of mutual concern. During this meeting, the Indian foreign minister brought up China's Belt and Road Initiative and criticized China for the aggressive methods that it adopts in promoting BRI. This was essentially an indirect reference by India towards the CPEC project, which threatens India's sovereignty. And this stand being taken by India also appeals to Central Asian countries, because even Central Asian countries are concerned about the rising aggressiveness and dominance of China. The foreign minister even brought up the issue of Pakistan-sponsored terrorism, which is affecting the Central Asian countries as well. And that is another common topic where India can work with these Central Asian countries. Then in a historic development, India's foreign minister also paid a visit to Armenia, making him the first foreign minister of India to visit the country. This shows that India is closely linking its Central Asian policy with its Eurasian policy. And India is looking to step up its trade and cultural relations with Armenia as well. India's foreign minister also gave support to the peaceful resolution of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict which took place last year between Armenia and Azerbaijan 
and has supported the peace resolution that has been worked out by the OSCE Minsk Group, which has been established under the leadership of Russia and other countries to resolve this dispute between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So this enhanced outreach of India towards Central Asia is clearly driven by the current developments in Afghanistan. India is deeply worried about the long-term impact of Taliban's takeover, especially on India's interests. And since SEO has become ineffective in handling the situation, India will have to work closely with the Central Asian countries through its bilateral relations in order to protect its key interests in the region. Thankfully for India, these Central Asian countries as well are very keen to work with India because they not only want to trade with India and export their resources to India, but even they are concerned about the role of Pakistan and China in the region. The Central Asian countries have always shown a lot of interest in the Chabahar port in Iran, which has been developed by India, because they know that access to Chabahar port will open up the Central Asian countries for greater trading opportunities with other Asian countries. The Central Asian countries are also deeply worried about the developments in Afghanistan and the rise in radical terror activities, which are sponsored by Pakistan because some of these Central Asian countries share direct borders with Afghanistan and they are already facing the direct impact of it. When Taliban was taking over the country, refugees from Afghanistan spilled over into these countries. And along with this humanitarian challenge, they even have to deal with the emerging security challenge in the region. You might even remember that during this crisis a couple of months ago, India managed to evacuate its nationals from Afghanistan thanks to the support given by Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, which border Afghanistan, because India used these countries as a base to organize the air evacuation to bring back Indian nationals who were stuck in Afghanistan. Then similar to India's concerns over the BRI, even the Central Asian countries are worried about China's dominance and they would like to counter China's dominance by working closely with India. So these are the challenges and opportunities that await for India in Central Asia. And in order to protect India's core interests in the region, India has been trying to recalibrate its relations with these Central Asian countries. Next, we have two articles on page number eight that are related to the 26th Conference of Parties to the Climate Change Convention, which is all set to be held in a couple of weeks at Glasgow in the United Kingdom. The key focus of this summit is on upgrading the previous targets that were taken up under the Paris Agreement in 2015. A few countries are pushing for a new target known as net zero emissions by 2050 and countries such as United States, many European countries like UK, Germany and the others and even China have already announced their net zero emission targets. While developed countries like US and UK have committed to a net zero emission target by 2050, China has agreed to achieve net zero emissions by 2060. Now, what do you mean by net zero emissions? See, net zero emissions essentially refers to the removal of greenhouse gas emissions through carbon capture and carbon sequestration technologies so that in net terms, a country has zero emissions. So whatever emissions a country is releasing into the atmosphere, they plan to remove the equivalent of it so that they achieve net zero emissions. While this new target is being pushed by these countries, India is not entirely comfortable with this target and until now India has refused to take up this target. The writer of the column supports this stand of India on the basis of the CBDR principle which we had discussed a couple of days ago. CBDR stands for Common but Differentiated Responsibilities which is a core principle of the Climate Change Convention which provides for differentiated responsibilities for different countries based on their historical emissions. Countries like India are not largely responsible for historical emissions. It's the developed nations like US and European countries and top emitters like China, which have to share a greater burden of historical emissions as nearly 75% of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is attributed to these countries. Today, even though India is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, its per capita emissions are still very low and India has hardly contributed to these historical emissions. But despite this, India has taken up very ambitious targets under the Paris Agreement as a part of the nationally determined contributions. And through these voluntary targets, 
India is already well on its way to achieving the 2030 targets that were laid down under the Paris Agreement. India is making a major switch towards renewables. And as per the target, we are planning to have nearly 450 gigawatts of installed capacity just from renewable sources of energy. India is also bringing down its emissions intensity by 33 to 35% from 2005 levels as India had committed under the voluntary targets of the Paris Agreement. So while India is one of the few countries which is actually achieving the Paris targets, other countries such as US, UK and China are pushing towards the new target known as net zero emissions. So the writer says that the 26th Conference of Parties must focus on reducing emissions by 2030 rather than focusing on the net zero emission targets of 2050. The writer says that despite the pressure from these countries, India will have to resist the pressure and stick to the CBDR principle. Because if you take historical responsibilities into account, the US is still lagging behind. And even countries like Russia and Brazil are creating roadblocks towards achieving genuine emission reductions. Even the editorial on page number 8 makes a similar call and is asking the participating countries at the 26th Conference of Parties to work out a meaningful response to tackle climate change. On the question of net zero emissions and on the pressure on India, the editorial also takes a similar stand which we just discussed in the previous column. The editorial points out that the developed countries have to show greater responsibility and countries like US have to draw lessons from UK and other European countries which are being more responsible and they should use the summit to genuinely provide the financial support that they are committed to to help out the adaptation measures in developing countries. Now let's look at this article from page number 1 and 10. China's parliament has adopted a new law which formalizes its aggressive military actions along the border areas. This new law that has been adopted by China's legislature comes into effect from the 1st of January next year and it calls upon the Chinese government and the Chinese military to safeguard the territory of China and to combat and counter any acts that undermine China's territorial sovereignty and claims. The law states that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the People's Republic of China is sacred and inviolable and the Chinese state should take all possible measures to safeguard the country's territorial integrity and land boundaries and guard against any act that undermines the territorial sovereignty and the boundaries of China. It calls upon the government to take all possible measures to strengthen border defense, to support economic and social development in the border areas, open up the border areas for improved public services, create the required infrastructure and to encourage and support the local people who are the inhabitants of the border regions. It calls for better coordination between border defense and socio-economic objectives and provides responsibilities to the Chinese military that is the People's Liberation Army and as well as to the Chinese government to manage the economic and security issues of the border areas. It also enables the PLA to conduct its border duties, including exercises, military drills, so that it can effectively act against any attempts at invasion, encroachment and provocation. The law does provide for negotiations with the neighboring countries of China in case of border disputes, but however, it largely empowers the aggressive actions of the Chinese military and the Chinese government, and it essentially formalizes China's latest aggressiveness against India's borders. Even though the Chinese legislature is just a ceremonial body which is largely controlled by the Communist Party of China, this new law adopted by the legislature is of significance because it comes at a time when the border disputes of China with India and Bhutan have acquired more limelight due to China's aggression over its border disputes. Now let's look at this article from page number 10. According to this article, Netherlands has shown a lot of interest to deploy a naval liaison officer at India's Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean region. The IFC IOR serves as the headquarters of India's Coastal Surveillance Radar Project and helps in promoting maritime domain awareness and information sharing. See, under the Coastal Surveillance Radar Project, 
India has built a series of radars all along its coastline, including the entire coastline of mainland India and the islands, that is Andaman Nicobar Islands and the Lakshadweep Islands. This key strategic project was taken up after the 2611 attacks, which exposed the gaps and weaknesses in India's coastal security and maritime security. This coastal surveillance radar project has the ability to track the movement of ships all across the Indian Ocean region. And we have extended the project to friendly countries in the region as well, such as Seychelles and Mauritius. In 2015, the installation of these Indian radars at Seychelles and Mauritius was completed and was even inaugurated by the Prime Minister of India. We are also planning to extend the project to other friendly nations in the Indian Ocean, such as Maldives and Sri Lanka. So this ambitious coastal security, maritime security project of India gives India a real-time picture of the shipping traffic across the entire stretch of the Indian Ocean. And all the data collated by these radars are integrated at a national headquarters located on the outskirts of Delhi, known as IFC IOR or the Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean region. This headquarters is managed by the Indian Navy and it provides for maritime domain awareness and as well as information sharing with other friendly navies. So friendly countries like the US, Japan, Australia, France and even Russia have been very interested in this project and they have all deployed their naval liaison officers at this headquarters which is managed by the Indian Navy. Now even Netherlands is showing interest in this project and it wants to deploy a naval liaison officer so that Netherlands can also gain access to this maritime data captured through coastal surveillance radars of India, which is all integrated at the IFC IOR. Now let's look at the mains practice questions. The first question, examine India's interest in Central Asia and its diplomatic outreach towards the region. The second question, Conference of Parties 26 must focus sharply on reducing emissions till 2030 rather than on net zero 2050, which is too distant a goal. Critically analyze. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer writing portal for which the link shall be shared in the description box below. So this concludes our discussion for today. Thanks for watching.